But tonight I want to talk to you, uh, before I left, I started a four-part series on the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Amen. That's the book for me. And by the way, I, as the pastor has already said, I do thank everyone that stepped up and, and, uh, and just, just helped out. And, and I especially also want to mention Hope doing the Facebook post as well. And, and she did a great job with that. So all of you, uh, I want us to praise God for that. Amen. For everyone that did their part. But we've been talking about this title of the series is His Book. Say that with me, His Book. And we talked about, um, you know, what kind of uh, Bible should I read? And, you know, getting off of Facebook and into, say that with me, His Book. Amen. And um, it's because the Bible is His Book. Amen. But it's also your book. Amen. If you need direction in your life. If, you're, if your life is not what it's supposed to be or needs to be, if you're confused, if you're wondering, if you're facing challenges, then the answer is to get into his books. And some of the things we have covered and will cover, can the Bible be trusted? We talked about that in the first sermon. It can be trusted scientifically, prophetically, and, and personally, and all of that. And is the Bible accurate? We talked about some of the accuracies uh, uh, in the Bible that proves that it's the Bible. Uh, contradictions. I haven't hit that yet. We'll do that hopefully before this is over. Uh, what about the other so-called Bibles? And, and last time I preached, I preached, what part of thou shalt not didn't you understand? You know, for every thou shalt not, there's a purpose. And it means God wants to bless us. And one of the most important questions uh, that we're going to answer tonight is this. Which translation of the Bible should I read? Now, I get asked that a lot as a pastor. Now, I'm go actually going to go where angels fit or tread tonight. Because one of, the most, one of the most controversial subjects that can arouse a lot of options. I remember one year in Falcon, we were having quadrennial conference, which means every four years we vote on issues. Uh, and about, it was several years ago. And somebody made a motion that uh, we had put in the bylaws a scripture, but we put it in the NIV. And someone made a, a motion that we put it into the K. KJV, King James, and I want you to know for 25 minutes, pandemonium hit that conference floor. Everybody was jumping up to give their opinion on why we should do it and why we should not do it. And finally, Jim Whitfield just had the answer. He said, it's out of order. We're going to keep it like it is. And that was controversial in the response. But that's another question. You can get people stirred up when you talk about Bible Translation. There are those who are the King James only people who say you must read the, the King James version and that only. And, and if you go to another translator, there's people that believe this. If you do any other translation but King James, it's tantamount to sin. Well, we're really going to talk about that tonight. You know, back in May of 2011, which was about eight years ago, a milestone was reached. It was, the, it was in that month, May of 2011, that the King James Version celebrated the 400th anniversary from 1611 to 2011. And without question, the King James Version has done more for the English language and politics, culture, and law, and spirituality than any other writing in English literature combined. And what is so special about the King James Version? Is it truly the only translation? What about finding a modern translation? I want us to talk about getting into his book. I want you to stand with me tonight, and I want to answer the question, what translation should I read. Uh, let's get into his book in Psalm 107 verse 20 and also Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, Psalms 107 and 20. And uh, if as you're finding that, I, I don't normally, I know I might get in trouble by saying this, but my mother was sick for a few weeks with the shingles and I'm glad she's uh, back tonight and and uh, she, she wasn't just gone because I was gone, she was at home in the bed. And uh, so we, we put her on the prayer list and she's doing better tonight. You feeling better mom? All right, that sounds good. Amen. And she said while the light is uh, better, longer, the days are longer, so she don't have to drive back at night. She said she was going to come uh, some on Sunday night because my little sister likes to sleep in. I'm going to just, I am in trouble. All right. I am in trouble tonight. But we're glad to have you anytime. Amen. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word. And what? Brother Schuyler, what did it say? That's right. That's right. Say, tell somebody I'm healed. Amen. 
Now go to Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. All right, all right. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Father, help us to love, help us to believe, and help us to get into His book. Lord, I pray, anoint your servant. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. And turn around and tell somebody you're glad to see them tonight. And God bless you. What or which translation of the Bible should I read? Now, let me, let me begin with this thought tonight. Let me begin with this thought. There was a time when the average person was forbidden to have a copy of the Bible. Now, I'm going to repeat that because I want, I want you to see where I'm going with this and lay this foundation. There was a time when the average person could not and was even against the law and forbidden to have a copy of the Bible. Now, that's hard to believe today. Especially right here in America with all the Bible bookstores and DVDs and CDs. But there was a time when you could not own your own Bible. Why was that? Number one, one reason why people didn't own their own Bibles was because the Bible was not written in the common language of the people. For well, thousand, almost 2,000 years really, from the time the apostles died out and the rise of the Roman Empire and the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, they translated the Bible into Latin. By the way, it was not originally written in Latin. It was a translation from the Greek and the Hebrew. But they translated the Bible into Latin and they said this, that the only True and proper translation of the Bible is Latin. If you translate it to English, you have sinned. If you translate it to Spanish, you have sinned. If you translate it to the... It must be read and must be written in Latin. And so they argued that... This is what they said. They said the Word of God is so holy that you must not put it into the common language of the people. It must stay Latin. Now I'm just going to stop right here and say, does that argument sound a little familiar? <laughs> Aren't you glad that the Bible is the one that you hold in your hand is not vlorum, plurum, and thrumum, and all of that? That's kind of Latin talk for somebody that doesn't know it. But that was one of the reasons why people, if they could get a Bible, it wouldn't have done any good because it was forbidden to be in only one language, Latin. And secondly, the church taught this for thousands of years. That only if you could read the Bible, it was only authorized to be read by the pastor or the clergy or the priest. In other words, they were licensed to read it and then tell you what it said. And if you tried to read it yourself, well, my goodness, you might come up with some crazy ideas. And by the way, there's a little truth to that. Kind of get a witness out there. But, uh, you know, they, they were so afraid that the common person might actually read that they didn't need a priest to pray. That they didn't need a preacher to go and get them sign their card to heaven. They, might, they were afraid. And that's where you talk about the American Revolution and liberty. You know where all of that started? When people began to hunger and thirst for freedom and and it came through the his book. Can you say amen? In fact, uh, uh, one, uh, another reason why people didn't have the Bible back then was because of modern technology. Uh, and the education of the common man. Most people could not read anyway if it were in their language. Most people were not schooled. And not only that, but to copy a Bible, they didn't have the printing press like we have today. They actually, to, to, if you could get a copy of the Bible, you had to pay a lot of money. And people had to copy it the old-fashioned way. They had to sit down, and it would take about one to three years to copy one version of the one book of the Bible. Now, while we were in D.C., we went to this museum of the Bible. It's a brand new museum built by the founders of Hobby Lobby. I don't know if you have those pictures up or not, but a man by the name of Gutenberg, uh, he, um, he come up with a uh, printing press. Um, what was that again? 
That's fine. If you can't find them, that's fine. Just give me a thumbs up. But I sent pictures. It says press one, press two, press three. But they came up with what was called a press uh, where they could actually make mass copies uh, of the Bible. And, and once the Gutenberg press was made, uh, in fact, that's a replica of it in the Museum of the Bible. In fact, you don't, just keep it right there. But where that gold piece is uh, uh, laying down is where they would put the letters. Uh, and then that thing that the gold piece that's leaning back uh, would come and press. And that's paper there in the middle and they would press it once uh, and press several copies uh, and then they change the letters and press several copies again. The I'm about to shout because uh, boy when that press was coming down, uh, liberty was coming. Uh, freedom was coming. Revival was coming because that paved the way for people to get the, into his book. Can you say amen tonight? And then, here's the fourth reason why the average person didn't have a Bible. Let's say you could read. Let's say you got a copy of the Gutenberg Press Bible. But did you know, finally, the church outlawed it. You could have been killed for having a Bible. If you got caught with having a Bible, uh, you would be subject to be burned. You had to give it up. Uh, and so, my friend, uh, when you think about all of that and how people back then, how they just could not, uh, the odds were against them uh, to get a copy of his book. Uh, and we've got to realize tonight how fortunate we are today. We've got a personal Bible. We've got an affordable Bible. We've got a Bible in our own language. Uh, thank God that we can get into his his book. Uh, we just take it for granted. Uh, it collects dust. Uh, people died so that we could read uh, John 3, 16 and Genesis chapter 1. Somebody ought to celebrate his book. And yet, with all the Bibles that are out there, and all the availability of the Bible, not only in written form, but in spoken form. People say, well, I, I can't read. There, there are people that can't read in this day and time. But you can listen to the Bible. It's on a phone app. You can let somebody read it to you. And it's really amazing that with all of the Bibles we have today, you still have the average person in most churches can't can't tell you the Ten Commandments, can't name uh, half of the Twelve Apostles, uh, and, and, uh, and if you ask the, uh, the average church-going person what the first five books of the Bible were, uh, they might say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and that's not the first five books of the Bible. That's the first five books of the New Testament. Come on. Now, let me just say this to you. If I tell you to open your Bible to the book of Isaiah, and you go in your Bible, and you've been saved uh, for six weeks, uh, and you're looking for Isaiah, that's a good thing. But if I tell the congregation to open your Bible to the book of Hezekiah, if anybody that's not a new convert, if in other words, you've been saved for two or three years or more, if you start looking for the book of Hezekiah, then you need to get into his book a little bit more, because there is no book of Hezekiah. Somebody say his book. Oh, my friend, uh, you know, and some people think that cleanliness next to godliness is a scripture. Oh, my friend, uh, we have forgotten just how important. We have forgotten just how precious. Uh, we have forgotten just how powerful this his book is. Uh, I heard about a lady uh, who wrote in her Bible as she read and every and her, and she died uh, and they found her Bible. And all over the Psalms and all over the Gospels in different places, there was the letters T and P, T and P, T, and they couldn't figure out what T and P stood for until finally in the back of the Bible she translated she had a little place there and they realized that T and P stood for this tried and proven and they went back and looked at their scriptures uh, when it said the Lord is my shepherd tried and proven when it said he sent his word and healed me tried and proven when he said that he would save from the gut guttermost to the utmost tried and proven how many of you know that you can try and you can prove uh, that this is his book uh, Give him a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. Say amen now. Amen. I want to give you three breakdowns of this message tonight. Of which translation should I use? A common question. And I want to start out with the origin and the impact of the King James Version Bible. Because truly, up until 1611, when that King James, there were other Bibles that were leading up to it. But when that 
version came out in 1611, it really revolutionized the world. And really, from people don't realize this. I'm old enough to remember this. I remember when there was a time when there was very few other translations. It was key. I had to learn King James because there weren't that many translations out there uh, that were available. Um, but let me, before I even start with the King James Version, let's go back and see how it built up. Uh, there were two people that are very important. Two men, John Wycliffe. Have we got his picture up there? John Wycliffe. Uh, you need to know who this person is. You need to learn this history. John Wycliffe lived in the 1300s. Somebody say the 1300s. That was a year before, a few years before Brother Elam was born. Amen. 1300s. He was the first person to ever say this, that the Bible should be in the language of the common people. Now, we don't, we take it for granted, but when John Wyc Wycliffe began to say that, he was considered an arch radical. The Bible in the common language. And he said, and I quote, all those who love Jesus, whether priest, knight, or laborer, must carefully study the gospel in the tongue in which the meaning of the gospel is clearest to them. I'm going to say that again. In the tongue that it is clearest to them. Can you say amen? amen? And as a result of this, he translated most of the Bible for the very first time in another language other than Latin. He came up with the first English version of the Bible. John Wycliffe. The first English version of the Bible. Remember what I told you? The fathers of the church said the Latin Bible was the only Bible and it's too holy to be put into English. Well, he said, no, it's so holy it must be into the people's language where they can read it and go by. Can, I, can, I, can you say amen? amen? And then he died in 1384 and 24 years later, the Pope of the Catholic Church had his grave disturbed. They pulled up John Wycliffe's bones and they tried him for high treason and uh, blasphemy. And they burned his bones to dust. Because they wanted the world to know they were against having the Bible in their own language. And then another man who was spawned by this or spurred on by this was the name of William Tyndale. William Tyndale. I should have his picture up there. William Tyndale in 1492... He took John, Wyc John Wycliffe's version and improved upon it and, and made a better Bible. And he, was su he had such a burden that every person get a copy of the Bible. He, he said this. He said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spares me my life or many years, I will cause, listen, the boy, boys, the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. Talking about the Pope. That's a good theme for Royal Rangers. That the boys that work and go to school know more than even the preacher knows or the bishop knows. Thank God for William Tyndale. Unfortunately, they uh, found him and he, he went to Europe for a while. He published many Bibles. Uh, and, uh, and in 1536, uh, he uh, was burned at the stake. William Tyndale, that man there, was bound and was alive like you are. And they put brush around his feet. And what was his crime? Translating his book. And yet we let our Bibles go to dust. And this man was burned to dust. And suffered. And this was in the year 1536. Now 1536. And after he was burned at the stake. Things began to transpire in the political realm. Uh, there was a godly set of preachers called the Puritans. Uh, Nonconformists to the Church of England. And they made such... They, through prayer and through fasting uh, and through just sheer trusting God. Uh, God sent him a king by the name of James. He was in Scotland, but then he assumed the throne uh, of the whole empire of England. Uh, and they told him, you can reign, uh, but we're going to have religious freedom. Uh, and King James uh, said, we need a Bible for this whole kingdom. And he got together some of the godliest, holiest men of England, men who prayed, men who sought God. He got bishops from the Church of England. They came together. And in, after six years, 
47 of the godliest men and scholars ever assembled since the days of the apostle prayerfully on their knees painstakingly and carefully produced what we now know as the King James Version of the Bible in 1611 and nothing has been the same since the King James Version came. Can you praise God for that? Amen. I love the King James Version. We owe all that we have uh, unto that great translation of the Bible. In fact, I went th back and looked, uh, and uh, it would amaze you how many times judges and lawyers and juries uh, have heard the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, and uh, the first thing a witness does uh, is they swear on a King James Version of the Bible. In politics, uh, uh, President Reagan, in fact, I, do I have that picture up there? Uh, uh, when I went to the Museum of the Bible, they had the President's Bibles that were inaugurated, and President Ronald Reagan this is, look at that, right over here. Version that is right there. He swore uh, himself uh, to uphold the Constitution on a King J Presidents uh, have been moved by the King James Version. Can you say Amen? Uh, lawyers and and uh, and even George Washington. Um, in fact, uh, somebody did a study and said that George Washington, um, uh, a man, had produced a twenty-page tabulation of two hundred and fifty biblical allusions in the writings and paper of George Washington. He was very thorough with the King James uh, Version of. Uh, the Bible, the Liberty Bell. We saw a replica of that when we went to D.C. On the, on the Liberty Bell, the bell that rung to proclaim liberty. Did you know there's a King James verse there? Proclaim liberty in all the land. Oh, thank God that, that the King James Version has, a, has a, a touched law and politics and even education. Did you know in the 1800s uh, that the school children of America were schooled in the King James Version of the Bible? In fact, think about everyday cliches. Let's think about today. You ever heard the phrase, well, money is the root of evil? You ever heard that? It came from the King James Version, not the NIV or the NLT or the whatever UT. In fact, they misquote it. It, it really should say the love of money is the root of all. Money's not the root of evil. Money's a blessing. I needed some on that trip. I'll tell you right now. Hallelujah. Money is the... And have you ever heard this phrase? Uh, so and so fell flat on his face. You ever heard that phrase? Straight from Numbers chapter 22, verse 31, when the guy that, uh, uh, his name escapes me now, but the talking donkey, what was his, uh, Balaam, right? Uh, the Bible says he fell flat on his face. Uh, uh, you ever heard this phrase, nothing new under the sun? It came from the King James Version. Uh, you ever heard the phrase, or you ever said this, well, I'm at my wit's end. That came from the King James Version. Do you know that the very first <clears throat> telegraph, uh, telephone, the, the birth of the modern, and we all have telephones. The first message ever sent, Samuel Morris, when he had the telegraph set up, electronic uh, relay of communication, which gave birth to the telephone and the computer. But the very first message was out of the, the book of Numbers, uh, what hath God wrought. Amen. <laughs> and what about Buzz Aldrin when they went to the moon and, and they, people don't, in all the movies I've seen, I've seen Apollo, uh, the one with Tom Hanks in it. I've seen that. I've seen uh, the, the movie First Man, which was come out a couple of years ago. And they completely rob all of the spiritual things those astronauts did. They took a Bible, they read scripture, they prayed. And none of that is in those Hollywood movies. Uh, but did you know that Buzz Aldrin, when he got up and first saw the earth uh, and from outer space, he quoted the King James Bible, Psalms 8 and 3, when I consider the heavens, uh, the work of thy fingers and the moons and the stars, which thou hast ordained over and over, instance after instance, thought, politics, religion, law, where we are today, we owe so much uh, to the King James Version. President Teddy Roosevelt said, no other book, the King James Version, has been ever written in English, perhaps no other book ever written in any other tongue, has affected uh, the world, uh, the whole life of a people, as this authorized version of the scriptures as reflected uh, in the life uh, of the, e God sent his word, uh, and he healed us. Uh, can you shout amen for his book? Come on and give him a hand of praise tonight. Amen. Thank you for the King James Version. Amen, somebody. I love the King James Version. I read the King James Version. In fact, when I'm reading, I'll reread into the King James because that's the only Bible I had to read. My great-grandmother, 
She, I could have never, and by the way, I could have never read the Bible without the aid of Alexander Scobie and a cassette tape of the New Testament. And I would play the tape, and there were, there were words in there that a little 12 year old boy could never read. But old Alexander Scobie, but he read them. And, and I remember as I read my Bible while he was reading it and I was reading behind him, I remember that word began to touch my heart and change my life. Thank you, Lord, for the, his book. Can you say amen? amen? Point number one, the origin and legacy of the King James Bible. Point number two, major point number two. What about Bible translations today? Can we honestly say that the King James Version today is the only Bible that you might. There are people who believe if you read any other version than the King James, they really believe you're not reading the real Bible. They really believe that you're sinning. Well, my only question is, and I respectfully say this because I know there may be some of you here tonight that you may feel that way. And I respect your feelings because I believe you have a high honor of the Word of God. But be honest with what, what you're saying. What do Spanish people read? They don't read these and thous. What the people in China read? They don't read the King James Version. If you're saying that that is the only Bible that a person can read, uh, you're sounding a lot like those Catholics that said that Latin is the only one. Come on, friend. God's Word is beyond language. Uh, God's Word is beyond King James or President Obama or anybody else. Uh, God is speaking to us today. Day in our language, his the his, the lines have fallen in pleasant places. There is nowhere his voice is not heard, and he speaks through the word of God. Say Amen. So up until 1970, other translations to begin to come in, and the King James Version is accurate, it's beautiful, it's poetic. Uh, but we have to be careful when we say that it's the only Bible. Um, now, why? Very simply, this. Words change over time. Say that with me. Words change over time. The words of 1611, some of the words of that day do not have the same meaning today. They just don't. For example, here's a word that has changed over time. It's not in the Bible, but the word gay. Now, some of you might not, some of you older ones, you, you remember when the word gay meant happy. Are we, we are so happy and gay. You better not tell people you're happy and gay now. Those songs that, well, I'm so happy and gay. You know, the word gay in, 19, in, in 1919 is totally different in the year 2019. Gay today means homosexual. What about, I say this respectfully, but the English word for donkey, and I'm not going to say the word, and you don't need to say the word. Now, I'll read the word as in the scripture, but we don't call a donkey today what King James folks call. In fact, if you use that word today, it's a curse word. And, you, and by the way, you shouldn't use those words. Those words that start with an A, those words that start with an S, those words start with a D, those words start with all the other letters, those are not words that that we as Christians now I'm not condemning you and sometimes some, I've been around some of you and sometimes it'll slip out but God loves you and I love you let your words glorify the Lord I told you I'm going with angels fear to tread tonight I'm telling you I've come back from vacation y'all might send me back I'm telling you this is words change say amen now go to sister uh, hope go to Job chapter 1 and verse 8 now I'm gonna read this from the King James Version Job chapter 1 and verse 8 and the Lord said unto Satan hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him a perfect and upright man one that feareth God and you ask a hundred people what that word is cheweth means and you'll get 90 to 95 of them that cannot have a clue what that means now, that's King James Version. Now, go over to, um, let's go to another scripture. Uh, go to Luke chapter 11 and verse 8. It says, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity. I'll bet you 50 out of 100 has no idea what the word importunity means. Go to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 says, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Does anybody know what intermeddleth means? Now, I know what meddling means. That means you're tending in my business. You need to quit meddling in my business. But we don't use the, we never use the word intermeddleth. 
Now go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5. It says this, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles. Were. Now, you're trying to tell me a 25-year-old kid, remember, they're kids to me. They might not be kids, but they're kids to me. I don't want them to know what the word, I want them to know what it means, but I don't necessarily believe they have to read that word concupiscence. I want them to know that that word means lust. Now, they know what that word means. Okay, and then here's another one. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. It says this. Have we got it? First Peter, it says, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. I promise you people today have no idea what it means to gird up the loins of your mind. Now for people who say that the King James Version is the only Bible, please understand there's six scriptures right there that would make absolutely no connection to the average reader of today. What did Wycliffe say? And what did Tyndale burn at the stake for? It was, as Luther said, so that the Bible could be written as if the mother was speaking to her children and they could understand what she said. My friend, God doesn't hold a premium on the word concupiscence or intermeddleth, but he does hold a premium on the meaning of those words. And that's where we must understand that God in every generation uses language to get his message through. Can you say amen tonight? Now, there's three types of Bible translations, and this is where I'm going to suggest that you make some notes here tonight mentally or go back and read. There are three types of translations. There are word-for-word -word translations. Say word-for-word. Word. What do we mean? We go back to the Greek, and we go back to the original, and I've told you there's 24,000 copies of those, plus the, plus the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and we go back and we translate the Bible word-for-word. Somebody say amen. Now, the word-for-word -word translations are the most accurate to the original. The top versions are the King James. Say amen, King James guys. <laughs> the New King James. By the way, I love the New King James because all it does is takes out the these and the thous. The New King James. The King James. Now, here's another one. New American Standard. The NASB is uh, a word-for-word -word translation that started in the 1960s, uh, and they just, oh, excuse me, 1995, they did a version of the New American Standard, and they just re-released it and updated it. How many of you know that language has changed just in the last 30 years? The New American Standard, they didn't add a lot to it. They didn't want to be licensed with it. They just went word for word. And then there was the, there is the English Standard versions, the ESV. That is the copy that I read the most of. The English Standard Version was made about eight years ago from reform, some Reformed theologians uh, who were very strict. They wanted, they wanted to take any chances. Uh, they wanted to make sure word for word as easily could be understand. And, and actually, now I don't have time to point this out. I can do it for you later. If you really want to know, I'll be glad to tell you. But they actually, some of the translations, translators uh, of the King James Version, they were relying on Greek and Hebrew manuscripts uh, that since then we have found the Dead Sea Scrolls and we found others that actually has helped us. So in a sense, God has kept his word. And would you believe it that we have in the ESV and the NASB, we probably have the most accurate English version Ever in the history of mankind. That's how God has kept his word. Say amen. amen. Nothing. Did I say anything was wrong with the KJV? No. Did I say anything was wrong with his other? No. If you had only one Bible to read. Read one of those versions. A word for word translation. King James. New King James. NASB or ESV. Say amen and love me anyway. Then there's not only the word for word translation. There's the phrase by phrase translation. Now what is that? So here's some versions of the Bible that will take not every single word and translate it. Because sometimes when you go word for word, it doesn't flow very well. Sometimes it doesn't make quite the sense. But yet we, we, we don't want to take any chances. We go word for word. There's the thought for thought or, or phrase by phrase translation. And what it does is it takes the thought and puts it into the modern vernacular. What you say is that bad? Well, it could be, but let me give you an example. Go to John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. John chapter 1, if you're there, say amen. It says, but as many, this is King James, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, watch this, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's a word-for-word -word translation from the King James. 
Now, if you go to John 1 and 12, and you don't have, a, you don't have this in front of you, but the NIV doesn't translate that word for word. It translates it phrase by phrase. Here's what they say. They say, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, are a husband's will, but born of God. The word husband is not in the original. Human is not in the original. But the meaning is there. You've not violated the original. You've just made it a little bit more friendly to read. Now, I tell you, the word for word is the most accurate. The phrase for phrase is helpful. So if you're going to use that, you're not going to be too far off the bit. God has a way of preserving his word. Now, what translations are phrase by phrase? I'll give you two. The NIV I just read and the um, New Living Translation. And by the way, on the record, for those of you watching on the Internet and those of you listening here, I do not recommend the NIV. If you read it, that's fine. Nothing, not, not going to, not going to, it's not going to destroy you. It's not going to burn you or send you to hell, but the NIV uh, has some problems in it, and I could tell you about that later. I don't have time to preach it tonight. But the New Living Translation is the answer to the problems of the NIV, and the New Living Translation is actually um, David Jeremiah, Chuck Swindoll, some of those guys uh, read from that and use that, and I trust them, and I've researched it. But that is the most, e the New Living Translation really makes it easy to read. And then there's not only the word for word, the phrase by phrase, there's the, what I called number three, and then we're about to close here in just a minute. The paraphrase. Now, what is the paraphrase? That's the least accurate. What it does is it takes the original and somebody like an author, like me or Eugene Peterson, the message, they will actually put it in a vernacular that's that's not inspired, but kind of captures the essence. Sort of like a preacher preaching. For example, let me go back to John chapter 1, verse 14. Y'all still out there? Do y'all still love me? Raise your hand if you do. <laughs> I don't know whose hands are lifted, but I, by faith, I believe you still love me. I know what y'all give me for Christmas, the King James, uh, and a big one. Uh, and you're going to just give me that Bible. I know you are. John chapter 1, verse 14. Are you there? Say amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the one uh, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, a paraphrase, for example, the message. I love the message because it says this, it says this, it says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I like that. Now, is that inspired? No, but I don't use a phrase or excuse me, a paraphrase as my main Bible. You say, preacher, what should I use? King James, NIV, message. I just said not the NIV, so scratch that one. So what should I use? Should I, you know what? Use all of them. Say amen, somebody. I'm going to use the word for word as my main study. ESV, NASB, KJV. That's my main rock Bible. But I'm going to pull down an NLT and just see what they say. And see if it adds light to the scripture. And I may even pull down Eugene Peters, Peterson's The Message. Uh, and say, oh, that's a, a way of, he sees it that way and hadn't thought of it that way. As long as it doesn't introduce false doctrine. As long as it doesn't deny the uh, virgin birth. As long as it doesn't do away with the, with the, scriptures that have to do with the blood or homosexuality or anything like that as long as it doesn't change the word I'm okay for you to it's like brother Philip he can read a scripture and say you know what this is what this means to me but as long as it doesn't change the meaning that's in the original say amen I like to hear a fresh look at different scriptures. So, so I use them all. I re, re, and I just make sure I'm anchored to the word for word translation. How many of you love the Lord tonight? In other words, use a word by word and then compare it with the phrase by phrase. And for even further clarification, maybe look at a paraphrase. In fact, the Living Bible. Does anybody remember the Living Bible? That came out in 1971. And it was in a green book. And I, now this is no, I'm telling you that uh, the 700 Club, they, they came up in the late 80s when I was just a teenager called The Book. And it was the Living Bible. And I got a copy of that. And this was before I got Alexander Scorby reading me the Bible. But I'm telling you, I could, I could read the book in the Living Bible. And I understood what it was saying. 
And so I'm not throwing these Bibles out. I'm going to compare, and I'm going to get into his book, uh, and I'm going to say, Lord, you are, you are stronger than translations. Uh, you are the God that watches over your word, uh, and as long as it's the truth, how many of you know that the truth uh, will make you free? Give him a hand of praise here tonight for his book, his book. People say, when there's so many translations of the Bible and the devil's this, the, the devil can't, if it's not really of God, you'll know about it. Amen. If there's, a tra if there's translators that are translating the Bible and it's not right, you will know about it. God will see that his word will be preserved. Can you say amen here tonight? Now, what about Wycliffe's Bible? What about Tyndale's Bible? What about King James's Bible? Let me close by asking, what about your Bible? I'm not talking about Eugene Peterson. I'm talking about yours. Is your Bible read? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6 and 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you, Hear me again. Thou shalt teach the word of God diligently to your children. You'll talk about the Word of God. when you Do you talk about the Bible in, 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 over the dinner table? You shall talk about it when you're walking down and strolling down the alleys and byways. Uh, when you lie down at night. When you rise up in the morning. James chapter 1 verse 25 says, Whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful reader or hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed. Hey, let me tell you something. The, the issue in America tonight is really not Bible translation. There are accurate versions out there. The problem is not Bible interpretation. We've got men of God that are preaching the truth. The problem is not inspiration, for God has inspired His Word. It's not translation. It's not interpretation. It's not inspiration. Let me tell you what's holding you back from His book is determination. You have got to read it. The problem is not that the Bible is unreliable. The problem is that the Bible is unread. That's why we see teenage pregnancy at an all-time high. Because somebody has not taught the young children the, the purity of, a, of, a, of being a virgin and keeping themselves into marriage. You've got to talk about that. You got to give scripture for that. You got to remember that Mary was a pure vessel of whom God came in and brought a great work through her life through purity and that doesn't mean God won't forgive when things happen we know he does because that's scripture too you've got to teach church attendance people today don't feel like church attendance is, is if we make it we make it if we don't we don't the word of God when you read it Genesis to Revelation man going to God's house in a public place of worship is absolutely critical to our witness to our work to our worship Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And I didn't mean you got to come three times a week, every single week. We know there's jobs and issues and things coming up. But it certainly don't hurt. In fact, I think it helps more than it hurts. I hear people who say, well, there's so much going to church, you can't even be a family. Well, people, families are less going to church today than they've ever been. And their families are falling apart by the seams. We talk about Christian America. You know what we were referring about back in the 1950s? You know what? In the 1950s, mom and dad got married. Mom and dad had three kids. And mom and dad on Sunday morning took their Bible in. And they marched themselves to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meeting, fish fry on Saturday, Sunday school. They'd read the quarterlies. And they would forbid their children to miss or else. My God, let us come back to the old-fashioned roots. Let's get back into here. This book, hallelujah. We're sitting at home watching a bunch of soap operas, and that's an oxymoron. It's, they ought to call it mud operas. Every now and then at Best Buy, somebody will turn on a soap opera in the afternoon, and I'm just bouncing back there checking on things, and all of a sudden my eyes get caught. And I see this good-looking woman and this good-looking man, and they're about half-clothed, and they're arguing, and they're kissing, and they're talking. And I'm like, no wonder this stuff is so tempting. You don't even need that in your house. We need the Word of God. Talk of it in the morning. Talk of it. Cut that phone off. Get out of Facebook. Get into His book. Glory to God. Now, I didn't say anything was wrong with watching TV. And I didn't say anything was wrong with Facebook. 
You love the Lord tonight, say amen. I'll tell you, that's why we see AIDS, financial ruin, depression, even worse, damnation. Deuteronomy 10 and 13 says, keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee for thy good. Somebody say amen. His book tells us about a little boy with two fish and two pieces of bread and fed the multitude. His book tells us about a little teenager facing a nine-foot giant called Goliath. His book tells us about the walls of Jericho seem insurmountable, but march around them and praise God and they'll fall flat. His book tells about a pastor going to a church full of dead Ben's bones. And you ought to hear preachers talk around camp meeting time. My church is this and my church is that. Have you read his book? Oh, Ezekiel went to a valley of dry bones, brother, and preached the word of God. Hallelujah, somebody. Oh, his book says greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. His book says he's going to prepare a mansion for me in glory. His book says God answers prayer. His book says I can speak to a mountain and say move and it'll be cast into the sea his book talks about Calvary his book talks about Jesus love how he died and was spit on and his book says on the third day he rose again his book will change your life why don't you dust it off and get into his book stand with me tonight I can't call anybody to the piano, so I can't quit. <laughs> Pastor, come on up if you don't mind. So, very godly lady, a very godly lady had some children that weren't so godly. And she had a lot of stuff. Home, assets, money. And she thought of something very clever. She, she wrote down her will, had it signed, and she put it in her Bible. Her will was in the Bible. Her, her Bible. And so when she died, and the children, greedy grubbers, wanted to see what they were going to get. Her son was the main one. He just thought he was going to get all this stuff. And the lawyer said, she has will to you only one thing. And that is her Bible. He was so upset. He took that Bible and that's all she gave me. This is all she gave me. I did this. I did that. And she's worth millions and I don't have anything. And he threw it on the, on the shelf and it just sat there and sat there. And somebody knocked it off the shelf one day. And out came the real wheel. What he didn't realize was when he got that Bible, <laughs> he got it all. <laughs> Come on and praise him tonight. You got it all. You got it all. Hallelujah. My, my altar call tonight, and the pastor's going to come, but my altar call tonight is I want you to make a commitment to get into his book. Amen. I know we're reading our Bible through. Some of us are lagging behind, and, uh, but I want you to come tonight. Pastor, come on up and take us. Hope take it put from Jeremiah here. 15, 16 up there. It's the power of the Word of God in his book. Yes. Jensen Franklin, great preacher. He was here recently, and I wasn't able to visit. He broke out on his face all over and he was so ashamed to go outside that he took scripture after scripture after scripture he pasted it on his wall and he would stay in the house and read those scriptures over and over about healing over and over and over I don't know if he knew Jeremiah 15 16 or not it says thy words were found and I did eat them and that word was unto me oh, glory. the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Yes. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. He said, I read those and I read them and I walked around my room. I was so ashamed to go outside. He said, one day I took one of them off the wall and I ate it. And he just kept saying those words. I just ate the word. And God healed that young man. And today he's on national TV. Today he's all over the world. Being used mightily of God. A great singer. Great preacher. Great man of God. Great friend of mine. But it was 
his book. His book. Read that with me, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Now put John 15, 16 up there. Real easy to remember. Jeremiah said, I'm called. I'm hand-selected. God chose me. He said his word was like a fire shut up in my bones one time. He said, I'm not even going to preach anymore to that crowd, that backslidden. They're not listening to me anyway. He said, but his word was like a fire. Yes. Shut up in my bones. Oh, glory. That I could not forbear. He said, I just got to preach it. I just got to preach it. I just got to preach it. But look at John 15, 16. You have not chosen me. Yes. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. As you go, as yes. Pastor Ricky yes. preached, Take his book. Yes. Hide it in your heart. Let it be a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. Learn to love it. Read it. Digest it. Meditate on it. Let it become a part of your being to where you don't have to think about it, that the word is such a part of you, so internalized that every decision that you make you walk in the light of God's Word. Aren't you glad for the Bible? Yes. I'm so thankful for the Bible. Glory. Amen. I'm so thankful that we have it. Pastor Ricky, you want to just lead us in some songs? You are great. You do miracles so great. This book is a miracle. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you are great, you, you do miracles so great, there is no 